everybody, and welcome back to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, he's Steve, and Mando shows us the way once more in episode 309 today, March 2nd, 2023. We're going to be getting right into our topic of the day, which is... The Mandalorian Season 3 Premiere Review. So there's no need to skip ahead whatsoever. Steve, I have just, I have to say it right now, Steve. I I feel compelled to tell you that I'm a very happy man after watching this particular premiere episode. It's a beautiful thing, Steve. It's just a beautiful thing. You know, I forgot it was actually coming out this soon. I did too. Because I wanted to watch the second season all over again before I watched this season. Uh-huh. And so, uh, I mean, yeah, there's a recap, but it's just not that, you know, the recaps are fine. It's just yeah. not as good as I'm obviously watching the entire yeah. season. So I'm like, who are the players again? I mean, I'm recognizing some faces, but uh, <laughs> I don't, you're like, what happened? What do we, where do we leave off? I mean, like, okay, I know Mando. I know Grogu. I know some other people. Yeah. But, um... Oh, man. I remember he had that. I remember they hopped up his ship. Mm-hmm. I think he made it all, like, supercharged. Yeah. Yeah. Epi- or I was going to say episode two. Season two was exploring the idea of how Mandalorian was, let, you know, initially he had let Grogu go to be right. with Luke Skywalker. Right. And so that was, that was a big deal because Mando had bonded with Grogu, that right. sort of thing. And then we end up seeing how Grogu comes back to Mandalorian or Mando. Um, and so we also get to see how he comes into possession of the dark saber. And so like there, there are right. all these different things that are going on with his journey. So now season three is set up in such a way where he has admitted from season two that he took his helmet off. Right. So that is a big no, no when it comes to the Mandal- Mandalorian uh, culture and, and traditions. And so he's looking desperately to try and find a way back in with that because he doesn't want to be exiled. He wants to come back in. So that's kind of where season three begins uh, more or less. And and if you recall, like, I mean, he also made a guest appearance at the end of Boba Fett. Right. So that was really cool to be able to see that final episode between Boba Fett and Mandalorian, uh, you know, watching each other's backs and and going to town on all of the uh, hapless villains. So, you know what I did in the beginning? Well, I know, you know, don't know what I did in the beginning. No. What I did, I can guess. So we watched it after streaming. Yeah. And so I was kind of in a hurry to get over, switch over to Disney Plus and, and watch it. And so <laughs> I, I I switched apps, and the Xbox couldn't really catch up that quick. Okay. And so I thought I had launched it, and I did, but I had launched season one, and I didn't know I did. And so I saw it, and I'm like, okay, this looks good. Yeah, they're doing a good job here, you know? And then I saw like the, the blue fish guy. I'm like, oh, he's back again. I thought he was only in season one. Okay, let's see what happens. Cool, he's back. That's awesome. <laughs> and then it was the whole bar scene. Like, you know, Tim Tate, I'm like, man, this is great. This is really starting off awesome. And I thought, this is really feeling familiar. Yeah, though. it really is. <laughs> so I just, you, you had the whole had uh, stop. Biff Tannen. There's something very familiar about all this. <laughs> yeah. You're like, didn't that one creature get frozen in carbonite last time yeah, in season right. one? I don't know. Yeah, I was so happy when uh, the end of, of episode one occurred because I, it's just, it's been a while since I've watched something where I was so giddy from beginning to end. And The Mandalorian has set a bar for itself that's very high. And a, and a lot of Star Wars fans, as you know, have really kind of pinned their hopes on the the entire franchise of Star Wars continuing with the Mandalorian simply because there have been so many other disappointments or shortcomings with like, you know, episodes seven, eight, nine of the films and some of the other types of uh, approaches they've made with some of the Disney plus stuff. So, you know, it, it is, I think, um, kind of a pressure cooker for them to a certain extent, just because I think they too are aware that they have made something special and sure. So they don't want to let the fans down and like, how do we continue moving on from there? And I mean, so like 
one of the universal traits of knowing something was really good that you really enjoyed it is when it feels like it was like over in five minutes. Like that was that the thing. It was true. like like the episode itself was probably, if I had to guess, around forty five minutes to an hour long. And I can tell you, it felt like it was ten minutes. The second thing of that, though, p- piggybacking on you, hmm. which I could do right now, you could, but I would probably break something, which would probably be pretty funny too. It would, anyway, fatty. So, uh, <laughs> just grab your like this little, what little hair you have left. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Give me a little spank. Yeah. Anyhow, there goes that hair. I digress. That's a that's worth digressing for. That's right. Um, it's also it feels like it, it's been like two or three years since we've had another Mandalorian season. Mm. To me, it doesn't seem like it's been just a year. Has it been only a year? I think it's only been a year. Okay, because I I mean. Last, yeah, it's yeah, difficult geez, to know. Have to look yeah, you have to look at because, like, God, like man. last year we had the the Boba Fett season, mm-hmm. which was kind of like the Mandalorian ish kind of show. But I don't recall if the Mandalorian season two also debuted last year or if it was the year before. Because hmm. we've watched an awful lot of stuff over the last couple of years, and uh, it escapes me for the moment. But right. I suppose Googling it or IMDBing it could probably give us the answer. Well, I think I'm wrong. Wait. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, yeah. Do I need to also look? Oh, come on. <laughs> it came out in 2019, right? I mean, the, the show started in 2019. Original air date, 2019, but when was... Well, okay, so I'm looking it up on Google and it says... October 30th of 2020. That was season two? The eight episode season premiered on the streaming blah, 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 blah. Yeah, this is according to Wikipedia. The Mandalorian season two came out on October 30th. Gosh, has it been that long? I guess. My goodness. Because I mean, right now it's the beginning of 2023. So that means, hmm. I mean, and this came out toward the end of 2020. So yeah, if this is correct, that means that we didn't have any Mandalorian in 2021. We did have Boba Fett in 2022, and I guess that kind of held us over until season three of Mandalorian came out. But my goodness, I didn't realize it was that long either. Well, then my feeling is correct, Ross. Mm-hmm. It feels like it's been a very long time. Indeed. I've been anticipating episode season. Season uh-huh. three, episode one. <laughs> season three, <laughs> premiere. <laughs> Episode one <laughs> review doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but you know, no. it is what it is. Yes. Oh, but yeah, it, it completely just blasted by. And I just, I sat there on the couch with a grin on my face and I was so pleased at the initial experience. And what's interesting is that, you know, if, if I look at the different types of star Wars shows that have come out on Disney plus, they've, for me personally, that there have been certain ones that have been more hits while others are misses. And I would say, you know, like if I think of um, Andor, for example, we've talked on this show about how there were a lot of strengths to Andor. I would place Andor for me in my, in my personal list at, at number two with Mandalorian being number one. Yeah. And that was because in, in um, Andor, they did a fantastic job of world building, right? right. You, you felt like you were immersed in the galaxy of Star Wars, how all these planets had different types of situations and people scheming and stuff. And it was just this big organic ecosystem, right? And that played very much to the strengths. And at the same time, like, I think there are certain personal preferences. Like for me, like, I just, I felt like the main character, I just, I can't bond with that main character. Sure. You know, he, he was not a Han Solo type or Luke Skywalker, or Orlando Calrissian, so on and so forth. But when I go to the Mandalorian, like everything fits perfectly. I love <laughs> the casting. I love how they approach the aliens. Yeah. There, there, there's uh there's so much to, to go through. So by the way, this is your spoiler alert because we are going to be talking in depth about what transpired in mm. said season premiere. So what did you think about the, the first episode overall? Well, it was over too quick. Yes. I was kind of, well, I mean, they did give us, what is it, 50 minutes or an hour or something? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> it just felt like it was 15 minutes, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> 
Why didn't they give us like two hours, Rush? I mean, really, honestly. We have been kind of spoiled God, if you late. think about how. I think Andor, they gave us the first two episodes. Is that right? Yes. And that was actually something, too, because you're like, oh, okay, I get to, like, yeah, like, oh, get to see a little more instantly right. and get a better idea of what's happening. And I was kind of, I mean, I launched Disney Plus thinking that there would be two episodes. Uh-huh. Uh, hoping there would be two episodes. Yes. And there was only one. I thought, all right, fine. I, I'll, I'll wait, but. I was actually hoping that they would have more than eight episodes. Like, I was thinking, okay, season three, everyone loves Mandalorian. Maybe Disney has green lit, like, I don't know, maybe three or four additional episodes. So we'd have, like, 12. But yeah. That's how they keep Disney Plus subscribers coming back, though. Indeed. We're going to keep on making more seasons. I'm going to give you a sprinkling of episodes. Oh, it's just so great. Oh, yeah. And then... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Come back for more. Uh, but there's not... There wasn't a whole lot of action in this one. There was this, this was, I think, more like setting up who to expect as a player. So you got Mando. Mm -hmm. um, you got the pirate henchman. And you got the mm -hmm. big pirate. Mm-hmm. And you got the forger lady person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's 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 pretty hard, Russ. She's like nothing gets a brim. nothing gets past her. Yeah, no, I really like her character. Um, if when you talk about action though, so let's talk about the intro because the intro was some of the most satisfying action. I mean, I was just like, oh, like I love the setup of like how we. I think it was on Mandalore, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, with the kid and the yeah, like they're yeah. going through the whole kind of uh, what is what is what's a good word for that? Like uh, not not a process, it's like a but like ceremony, ceremony, of, yeah. yeah, rite of passage. Kind yeah, of deal, exactly. Yeah. And the kid looks super cool. Like I love the the facial features of the kid. He just I don't know. Like there was something about a little little je ne sais quoi about uh, the way the kid looked. That like I'm like that kid looks like he belongs in Star Wars. I kind of thought you were gonna think something else about the kid, honestly. No, no. I mean, I was looking at the kid and like, I mean, like the kid, well, I will say the kid's long hair kind of stuck out to me a little bit just because every <laughs> like Mandalorian that we've seen, like you don't see hair coming out from underneath the helmet. They're, it seems like they all kind of more or less keep their hair up. It's so when they to, put the, the yeah. helmet on the kid, it's like all this hair is it's like, <laughs> you have to take that helmet off to cut that hair. That's what I was thinking. man. But anyway, really like the setup of it. And I was not expecting that huge amphibious alien creature to come out of the water. And I was like, whoa, this is cool. And, and you just, and once again, like I think for, for the, the, the viewers, one of the, the strong suits of the Mandalorians is we just always, we love seeing them fight because there is such a kind of a sense of unity right. and bond that they share and, and their weapons are just really cool. And, and they know the capabilities of what they can do and their weapons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're, and they're not showboaters. Like they, yeah. they actually just, they hold their own. There's a, there's a silent strength about right. them that I think a lot of people respect and enjoy and stuff. So when that happened and we saw them start to take on this beast and how they are protecting the little ones, you know, they're telling them to get back to the cave and stuff. The whole thing, I mean, you had some of them like initiating their, their uh, jet packs. And so they were sure. fighting from up, up above somewhere down below. And, and, uh, and I love too how we quickly realize the hide of this, this alien is like super tough. Like they Armored, are really yeah. not able not to make a dent. Jack. Yeah. I liked how the, and it kind of goes without saying, but I just liked seeing it, how um, the, I'm just going to call, I don't know what her name is. I'm just going to say the Forager because that's yeah. the only thing I can remember is she's Forging the forger. all the armor yeah. and whatever. So um, anyway, she is handing the helmet to the young Mandalorian. Yep. And she could tell like something is happening in the water. Like maybe she, the water was stirred and she recognized the, the wave pad. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. And I like how she protected yeah. the little one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I liked that. Um, just, it wasn't nothing said. It was just like the, the body movement of, of how she was protecting him. It wasn't like, okay, well you're on your own now. I'm giving you the helmet. Like you go fight, even though like you're, you're 10, you yeah. know? Um, but then the second part of that I liked was that even at like eight years old or 10 years old, however old he was, the kid knew he can get swallowed by this thing. Yeah. But he was still of the mind of, I need to protect my brothers. Well, in a yeah, way. yeah. He, he wanted to contribute and he had a sense of duty of also trying to do what little he could in order to try and prevent any of the other Mandalorians from getting hurt really badly or killed. 
so yeah, I picked up on that too. Right. I, and again, like that's that resonates with the audience because that I mean, th- those are very noble traits. And I think also too, a lot of people want that for themselves in re- in real life. Like, right. imagine if you had like a tribe of. Uh, these these different uh, folks who share the same type of ideology and uh, value system, and not only that, but like have it almost also be focused around the idea of combat. About I mean, these are very proficient fighters, right? And they're able of they're they're capable of doing like so many different uh, types of fighting and combat and stuff. And so uh, it was super cool. So then we all then we see. Uh, Mando's ship come in and do like an initial blast on the alien, and you, but you don't see who it is yet. And you're like, whoa, that was a bigger explosion. And then you see the ship, and, and I mean, I just got so I don't know, I, I was so Twitter painted. I was like, yes, yes, and he's coming in with his ship, and he like shoots at the alien. And like when you see the beast get hit by those blasters, um, by the N one starfighter, I mean, you see guts. Like, I mean, I don't know if you caught that, but there's like blood and guts that just go. Oh, in slow motion and I was like yeah his goose is cooked now yeah there wasn't anything gonna I mean the armor is thick but it ain't like starfighter thick I mean no. that stuff's anyway I'm about to geek out and nerd and <laughs> 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 when you have a Pidian armor plate yeah. you just can't get through it <laughs> anyway <laughs> so I, I I I was thinking that was uh, like a flashback I was like is that kid gonna be uh, what is it what, what is his actual name like did did Din, Dinjarin or Din? I don't recall. I always call him Mando. Well, that's what they refer to him. As, yeah, but I, mean, I, I don't remember like his his actual. Anyway, I thought it was him as a kid, and I was like, okay, this is a flashback. All right, cool. Let's see what it happens. And then I thought, okay, if it is a flashback, and he is the kid, he might just like take that beast down as as he is. Uh, and then when he when he of course flew in, then it kind of brought everything back to current events. Right. <clears throat> oh, yeah. 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 Well, and, and talk about <laughs> like, what is the perfect way for him to come back to his tribe? Right. I mean, he's still exiled, but like, just, just, you know, I think of like Jim Carrey's line from Batman forever where they're like, your entrance was good. His was better. The difference <laughs> showmanship. And it was just fantastic. Like he lands the, the in one starfighter, And I'm just like, yeah, if there was ever a way to like, kind of, you know, earn favor with right. your kind again, it was that. And you could tell, like, they were, they were just dumbfounded. They were like, it's Mando. <laughs> and he's got a cool shit. Yeah, he's, he's got a little mini Yoda. <laughs> so, I mean, I loved how that completely set the tone for season three. I was in, I was like, that was awesome. That yeah. was super, super cool. And then things slow down for a bit because, you know, we're being caught back up with uh, some of the exposition. And so we watch it as he speaks with that forger, woman and essentially is sharing once again, how he desires to have atonement and he wants to be able to go to Mandalore and be able to bathe in the waters, I guess that are under the mine or something like that. But like, you know, she's talking about how that place was destroyed by the empire, how that doesn't exist anymore. And he's, he is so obsessed over wanting to atone for his sin that he's willing to go check it out regardless because he, he really, he believes, you know, he, he's one of those like staunch believers in the code of the Mandalorians. And there is also something admirable about that, despite the fact that it sounds like it's not going to be an easy journey. Right. But if, okay, so, but that happened that when that got me thinking, okay, so if all the mines are gone, then the Mandalorian line is also kind of gone because if they all came from this, Rite of passage, then how can there really be, you know, any more of them? I mean, maybe that was just, okay, if you make a mistake, you have to do this. I don't know. But like they, they mentioned one thing where they said you weren't forced to take off your helmet. And actually at one point he kind of was not by gunpoint, but he had to take his helmet off because they were going onto the ship and they had to be in disguise. And so he, they, he did have to take his helmet off. That's one time I remember. And then another time I remember, once when he was on that planet, uh, there was nothing really but but farmers and fishers. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, yeah, towards the end of the episode, you saw him put his helmet aside. And I just figured, okay, he had to eat something. 
Yeah. So in that instance, it wasn't as though he was revealing his face to anyone. And I think that's the, at the crux of it all is I think you're not, you know, you're never supposed to remove your helmet and expose who you are to other people. Like if you do it privately, I think that's okay because like, yeah, like how else are they going to drink and eat if, I mean, what are they going to do? Put a straw like somewhere out there and, (laughs) you know, if they, if they have to wash their head and face, like, you know, I don't know my interpretation of it. And, and, you know, maybe it's worth looking up online just to see what the actual correct uh, way that, that, uh, that they do things is. But my understanding is, is that as long as they do it when they're alone, it's okay. So pretty interesting indeed, but, Mm. oh, so we go from that to then him flying out to see his old friend, which we had, I don't think we've seen. I don't know if he was in, I can't remember if he was in season two. He was definitely in season one. I thought he was in season two. He might, yeah, he may have come back in season two for a little bit, but it was really cool to see like how he's moving up in the world. One of the things I loved about seeing him was the two little small droids that were like carrying his cape behind him. Did you notice that? I didn't. You didn't notice that no. they're walking around town and, and, and also when they were in his office and you know, he's got that pretty like extravagant looking cape. If you notice in the back, like as he's walking, there are these two little droids on these like singular wheels and they're holding the corners of his cape wherever he goes. It was a pretty nice touch, I must say. (laughs) I like the scene when he uh, actually held his own, though, because, yeah, up until now, we've just seen him being an authoritative figure or a negotiator kind of a public figure. Yeah, a public figure, a politician kind of guy, but you never see him. Uh, fight, really. Right. And so you see him hold his own, and I thought, I was waiting for him to go like, Mando, you're going to back me up on this, <laughs> right? And he didn't. Mando was anyway. But um, he, he just w- pulled out his p- I mean, quick draw style. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah, it definitely goes back to the whole spaghetti western theme, which is fantastic. And the, again, I, to your point, I also love seeing how Mando just organically inserted himself. You know, Mandalorian is, um, or I should say Mando more specifically, is so loyal to his friends that he will back them up in dire situations. And we saw that again with Boba Fett, right? Right. We're like, you know, he just said, this is the way. And he's like, are you sure? Because I don't know if we're going to be able to survive this. You you don't owe me anything. And all Mando did was look at him and said, this is the way. Right. And it's like, so dude, awesome. that guy is awesome. Man. So we saw that to a certain extent in this instance too, where, you know, he's just leaning casually on a tree, just letting his friend handle business. And then when they started to threaten his friend, then he starts stepping in and saying like, oh, I'm sorry, do we have a problem? And I blinked and I should have fat rewinded it, but it did was, was it Mandalorian who took out the henchman or was it, um, what's his face? So his friend took out, uh, well, he didn't take him out, but like he shot the blaster out right. of that guy's hands. Vane. And uh, what, what was Vane? it? Vane? V-A-N-E? I don't remember what, what, is, what the pirate's uh, name was, but. I thought it was Vane. But you could tell that they had a past, right? Like, like it's not like, like they were enemies or anything like that, but at the same time, there was kind of like this like power struggle going on where like he was used to the town as it once was and didn't like being told what to do because he was a pirate and he enjoyed the privileges that came along with that, whereas Mando's friend had kind of left that that lifestyle behind him and was like, no, this is how it is now. Here, just come to my office. And the guy, the other guy was just being a jerk. It was Mando who shot the henchman because that towards the end of the of the show, when the same pirate yeah. comes at him on the ship, you know, and they're flying through the asteroid field. He's accusing him. He's like, yo, you've killed my brothers in cold blood. Yeah. It wasn't the other guy. It was, it was. Right. Mando. Yeah. I, I was going to get to that where like his friend was the one who shot the blaster out of the other guy's hand, but yeah. it was Man- Mando who stepped forward and shot like four of the other pirates around the other dude. So, um, but in, in, in speaking of the pirates, that was also something where I was really happy to see the, a return to the, the, the practical makeup effects, right? The prosthetics, the alien prosthetics on the actors themselves. It wasn't a bunch of humans walking around. 
And it wasn't a bunch of overused CGI. Like they, once again, embraced the old school approach that we've all come to know and love with the original Star Wars trilogy where like, yeah, you have these alien creatures that are basically these costumes and stuff that people have. And we just buy into it. It's like, it's, it's a part of Star Wars. Like, I don't care if it doesn't look as sophisticated as like a CG sure. character, but like, makes it tangible well you look at like the the main pirate guy right who who got his his blaster shot out of his hand the articulation in the mask when he was speaking was really good like i thought it it was it was well done and 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 i thought his his mouth was actually cg no it was it was all prosthetic like that's what was super cool about that whole situation was you had an advancement in the prosthetics but you also had an actor that really embraced the character he was playing. And so that feeds into the, the physical performance. So I don't know what the cost difference is between CG and practical effects. I don't know. I would assume, oh, come on. I would assume generally speaking <clears throat> that uh, CG is more expensive. Yeah. But at the same time, I think also prosthetics, you know, like it, it does cost a, a pretty penny also to, to get that level of quality. Mm-hmm. You know? But anyway, so we see that go on and then um, you kind of uh, alluded to the, the whole like space battle. Once again, another action sequence, which, which was a lot of fun to see. You know, they, they go into an asteroid field. I love the ships. I mean, like when you think like speaking of CG, the CG that was in the show has always been top notch. Yeah. You know, I'm watching this episode. I'm like, this could totally be a movie. Like you're watching it and you're like, yeah, it's like, Something I I would be in a theater watching. It's that good. Like they have been able to achieve a certain level of quality within the the Star Wars CG effects that we as as viewers get to benefit from. And so it was fantastic watching them dogfighting through that asteroid field and not not quite knowing like what was going to happen. But then all of a sudden, you know, Mando Mando is able to reinforce. It's like, Hey, I'm a bounty hunter. Like (laughs) I'm no like little Joe Schmo over here. Like you guys are some like little petty pirates. I hunt things and people for a living. Like do not underestimate me. And then we see that come to fruition where he is just hunting down them sequentially to the point where like that one dude is left. And then what's nice too, is that, Oh, well then there is some kind of trap that they're laying for him. And, What did you think of the captain? I thought he should be in Pirates of the Caribbean a little bit. Yeah, (laughs) a little bit. (laughs) Uh, I I mean, we'll see more of him. Uh, I think I'll hold off my opinion until we see more of like his lines and costume and whatnot. But when I saw him for the first time, I just kind of thought, man, algae. Yeah. Algae boy. Yeah. And, And again, practical effects, like the makeup effects, the suit, the costume, It's cool. Like, I mean, it was really, really nice. The one thing that I do have an issue with is I felt like they leaned a little too heavily into the whole pirate thing. (laughs) Well, it's only episode one. I mean, there might be another batter villain later, but, but you know what I mean? Like, like when you're watching the, like for instance, like the, the main mother ship of the pirates, you know, they kind of are matey kind of sound like this as I, and it's like, okay, that's uh, a little, uh, that's a little heavy handed. Like I'm starting like to, like to what you just said, I'm starting to get kind of pirates of the Caribbean vibes. Mm. So like to me, space pirates don't need to sound literally like how right. we've all been conditioned to <laughs> like expect pi- like pirates of the sea to sound. <laughs> but I mean, that's like a minor gripe. Not a big deal. What's that? Uh, what's that? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next thing you know, we're going to hear Mandel say, Polly. Yeah. Polly. <laughs> like, okay. Too far. Oh, hello. Bobby. Um, but that was cool uh, when he, I thought, okay, uh, they're going to do a tractor beam. He's going to get called. All right, here we go. I kind of thought that's the way that it was projected. Yeah. Right? Okay, he's going to get caught. That's how, they, but then he just kind of hits the, the space nitrous <laughs> and busts out of there. Uh-huh. Light, uh, light speed style. And again, that just reinforces the notion, hey, the guy's a survivor. Right. He's a bounty hunter. He's a survivor. He knows how to handle himself. And he's, I mean, that, that's part of the mystique too. Like it was the same thing with Boba Fett. You never knew how many toys he had, right? Like you knew he was well equipped, but you didn't know everything. And it's so like in these dire circumstances where like you're thinking, oh, okay, I think he's, 
He's going to, he's going to meet, meet his maker now. And then he pulls something else out and you're like, Whoa, what's cool is that he has the, this glow of, I know my surroundings and wherever I'm walking into. And I think at least I, as an audience member, am used to people go, or actors going, man, it's going to be a tough situation. I'm, I'm going in there. Like, okay, watch my back. You yeah. know, hold my breath sort of thing. And, and Mandalorian walks in there, not cocky, not arrogant, but walking in knowing, I know your abilities. I know your abilities. You're packing something there. You're packing something there. There's six of you. There's one of me. If you do pull this out of the other, I'm going to shoot that guy first, that guy first. I'm going to see if I, he'll live, but he's okay if he dies. And he's already mapping out how he's going to take everybody out. And that's every single time where he is. And he can hold like a very intelligent, but um, very few word conversation. He just gets the job done. Yeah. He has excellent situational awareness. And I think in terms of, like so some of the skill sets that he has, and we've seen this in the prior seasons, he's been able to travel to all kinds of different planets. We've seen him, for instance, be able to speak with the sand people, right? That's like so he's cool. not fighting the sand people, but being able to use different types of hand gestures and make the voices and, and the, the, the kind of grunts and stuff that the sand people make, which again speaks to his intelligence. I mean, he has a certain command of various linguistics in addition to the combat. And again, it, it, he's just a very well-rounded character. Yeah. Oh, the hero we need, Reza. Oh, my. What do you think of the uh, the sequence towards the beginning when they're flying through light speed? Man knows napping. Uh-huh. You're making me jealous. I wish I could nap like that. <laughs> and then Grogu is watching... All of oh, like the yeah. light and everything. It looks like he, he would imagining some sort of whale or beast traveling alongside them. And at first I thought, okay, that's what he's imagining. But then they started scaling away from the ship and showing other shapes. And I thought, okay, is that sort of real or is that still supposed to be imaginary or artistic or? I, I interpret it as real. I think yeah. Grogu was looking around and I think that John Favreau and company were wanting to explore some of what's possible or what could possibly exist within hyperspace. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're going light speed, it's something that, that like, I think, I think we've all been used to just seeing, you know, the star lines go and then you see the ship blast and then they come out of hyperspace and you know, they are, they do whatever it is that they came to do kind of thing. But we don't really necessarily think beyond that. Like when they're in that kind of light speed tunnel, what else could exist? And I think that was really neat. It had kind of a whale vibe, almost like they're underwater and they're seeing these big silhouettes going on. You know, the shapes were not whales, but they were kind of sort of in that direction. And it's, it's a, it's a great conversation starter. It makes one wonder, you know, are there certain types of creatures in this galaxy that are capable of light speed travel? It's never been broached before. I mean, that, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if, if they're ever going to explain that later on in the season, mm. but even if it's like just kind of like this fleeting visual, I don't know. I kind of liked it. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's kind of a, I don't know, a glimpse into like when you're traveling, even, you know, first of all, it shows like how big the, the galaxy is where they're going the speed of light. But at the same time, the distance is so far. Hey, you still got to wait a little while before you get there. Enough to take a nap. Indeed. And I nice. liked how Grogu has the ability to like, he has his little area up in the back to look around, but then he can go down below and then get into Mando's right. lap. I think right. that's pretty fun. <clears throat> yeah. Speaking of Grogu. So I know I talked about at the end of um, season two, how I was a little concerned about, okay, what is the future prognosis going to be like for the Mandalorian show? Just because I felt that we more or less really explored the relationship between Mando and Grogu and how I, I for one really wanted to start to see Mando go on some of these other adventures, you know, like, like maybe the Grogu chapter could come to a close and then we get to see what else Mando gets himself into. And when they brought Grogu back, I was thinking to myself, that seems to be kind of too soon. Right. You know, like, I wouldn't necessarily be against the idea of maybe a couple of seasons later, maybe their paths cross again or something to that effect. But now that Grogu is back with Mando, you know, my question is what kind of value or purpose does Grogu bring 
when man, my, you know, Mando's going on these different things. We know he can be adorable and cute, and that gets uh, a certain percentage of the, the audience to, to fawn over Grogu. We also know that Grogu is capable of doing of using the Force to a certain extent. But I want to know, like, okay, what was the the driving reason? Like, what there? I'm hoping there is like some sort of driving purpose as to like why they felt compelled to bring Grogu back. And I hope it's not limited to just because he's cute. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, you know, and I actually thought that looking at the um, the the poster art that Disney Plus had for Mandalorian season three, where he's like swinging and he has the you know yeah. Uh, Grogu in his arm. I, and he's been trying, I kind of lost track. I mean, he was supposed to get him to Luke and he got him to Luke and then he took him back. And then I just don't know if he's just responsible for him from now. Like I don't. So yeah, there needs to be some sort of purpose. And also I kind of thought uh, along those lines where the, uh, the bounty hunter droid. IG 11. Okay. I was going to say IG 77. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So he IG eleven uh-huh. was in episode geez season. <laughs> he was in episode one of season three, but he was also in season one and two. So they keep bringing him back as well, which plays a little bit of story. I mean, in the first season, he's actually really cool. Oh, he was one of he's my favorite awesome. characters. Yeah, and. In season two, these reprogrammed to be like a servant, right? He was serving. He was serving. I uh, don't remember. And then he self destructs, but he's not. A, he's not a bounty hunter droid. Well, no, no. He so he was when he self destructed. He was going and helping Mando on a mission, but he got gunned down to the point where um, he 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 just couldn't do anything else, and so his part of his program went pr- bleh, programming was to self-destruct. Now, I don't know if it was like when they were kind of on the hunt for Grogu. I'm a little hazy on that. I'd have to go back and rewatch seasons one and two. But the idea being that IG-11 was also a bounty hunter that was looking for Grogu, which is why when they powered him back up and he sees Grogu, he instantly goes into uh, termination mode. So that's I think that's where he left off. But I mean, his whole character, like I've always been enamored with that character since the the original Star Wars trilogy, because you saw him kind of in the background. You never really saw what he was or what it was capable of. And then you you, you start watching Mandalorian and luckily they so decide cool. to explore oh, the character. And, and yeah, one of my favorite characters of the show. And Mando doesn't like the the droids, but he wants this droid. Yeah, of course. But back to... <laughs> season one the one of the coolest things i keep remembering is is after that whole gunfight and the mandalorian and ig11 walk over to grogu and they're both just kind of enthralled and in awe of grogu and even that, him as a droid came across as having feelings like i need to kill this thing and i'm hesitating but i need to do my job and then Mandalorian goes, like, definitely no, I'm not. But he's playing it as if he will, just to so he can cap the the Andro- uh-huh. android. Uh, anyway, I just thought that that hesitancy on both parties was definitely really cool. He just didn't walk up to him, gotta kill, gotta kill. You know, he did. He just looked at him for a while, made whatever calculation or analysis he had to make. But I remember even like the voice was like, no, I have to, this is something I, I have to do. Yeah. I need to watch that episode over again because I do, I feel like IG 11 is one of those droids that has over the, over time has had a lot of different upgrades and updates to its firmware and its programming. And perhaps there are layers upon layers of different types that have been placed there. So like when it came to looking at Grogu, it may be that there was kind of a sorting process that the droid had to go through where it's like, okay, this is technically a child, right? right? Which they refer to it as the child. Right. And so maybe like there was some hesitancy (laughs) in the sense that like in his programming, it's not supposed to actually um, kill uh, uh, children, (laughs) so to speak. But then it was overridden by what his his directive or it's I keep calling it he, but it, it directive. it's directive. Right. 
So, but you know, you bring up a good point in the sense that having IG 11 come back in season three, as well as Grogu. So when it comes to IG 11, I can see how there would be a purpose for that. I can see how there is more to explore with that character, but I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with Grogu in the sense of, okay, long term, like what, like I, I really love the idea that Grogu went with Luke Skywalker to train and learn in the ways <clears throat> of the right. force. Like that was a wonderful bookend. So I don't really know what to expect if that's Steve. Mm. Not exactly sure. Well, Russ, what nights are these episodes supposed to come out? Is it every uh, Wednesday now or what? Yeah, every Wednesday. Yeah, well. And it's not at a specific time. I think it's like right when Wednesday becomes Wednesday, maybe like one or two in the morning on yeah. a Wednesday. I had friends wake up first thing in the morning. Watch, Russ. So it's available in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also see Mandalorian. I keep going Mando. Mando. Mm. We, um, go to what I believe is Mandalore. And that's where that, that uh, Mandalorian uh, oh, castle yeah. is, which I thought was really cool too. How like he was telling Grogu, Oh look, here's a Mandalorian castle. I'm like, Oh sweet. Okay. We're starting to see a little of the history of the Mandalorians and stuff. And the building the was super cool. Of Mandalore. Yes. And that and, chick was there. Yeah. Bo-Katan was, Thank was you. there on the throne. Um, really loved like her pose on the throne itself. Like mm -hmm. I thought it was super cool. Um, just it, it was very indicative of her character. And I, and once again, I was glad to see her make a return in season three, because once again, we did get introduced to her and what her initial motivations were, but then you, it, there were certain kind of complications where like Mando refused to give her the dark saber. And so she therefore could not go and basically accomplish her mission. And so she's feeling a little salty about that. And, for, for them to, to talk and for him to share with her, like, Hey, look, I, I'm, I'm looking to, to, you know, do make a, make an atonement for what I've done. I'm looking for these waters to bathe in kind of thing. And even she was saying how she didn't think that anything was left, but she gave him what we believe to be is the correct, um, coordinates or like location, which she said something, she murmured something after Mando left that almost caused me to think, was she sending him purposely to the wrong place to maybe like get him hurt or killed or something as like kind of a, a spiteful payback for not giving her the dark saber. There was something there in the end. I'll have to rewatch the episode, but like, I was just like, wait, did she really, did she steer him wrong or did she tell him where the last known location was? Well, she did ask him if he had the dark saber. Mm-hmm. So that was going through her mind, Raz. It was. Mm. It was indeed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My goodness. And I'm also, you know, speaking of the dark saber, mm. we're just transitioning from thing to thing here, Steve. That's great, Raz. So the dark saber is still very hard for Mando to wield. That's heavy. And I can't remember. Is it because Mando lacks some of the Jedi skills? Like, is, I can't remember. There, there's a certain criteria that they were talking about where he has to master and then the dark saber will become lighter in his hand. But right. because he's not trained in that way, it feels like he's lugging around this huge weight. He really can't fight with it at all at this point. So that is also some foreshadow, I believe, in season three, where maybe we, we, we will be able to see a bit more of what he is capable of doing with the Darksaber and just what, what else the Darksaber is capable of itself. I'm sure it's sharp. I'm sure it's dark. I'm sure it can kill and slice. <laughs> I do think overall, though, that... Um, oh, hey there, Steve. Oh, how's it going? I'm supposed to say something <laughs> oh, now. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> I was... Uh, I was really impressed with how they set up a lot of these different things within this first episode. I mean, there, there was exposition, but it wasn't boring exposition in my opinion. You know, I think that they did a good job of reminding us of like certain key factors, key elements from the previous two seasons, as well as now we're moving forward and seeing uh, what lies ahead for Mando itself. But I mean, I'm so happy, so happy that this, this show's uh, back. <sighs> Mandalorian is 
the linchpin of Star Wars at this point in time, as far as I'm concerned, Steve. Yeah. Mm. What about you? Oh, I agree, Russ. Mm. I agree. Do you have any other last thoughts about the uh, premiere? You know, I was about to end the show. What? And then I, no, well, I mean, the show, I was over. Oh. And I was like, ah, hit the B button, y'all go back out into Xbox. Uh, and I thought, no, I got to go back. I got to look at all the artwork. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. And I like the ending music, too. I was about to say, the, the ending music is really fun just to sit there and... <laughs> that little, like, cowbell, whatever that thing is. <laughs> I don't know, it's not a cowbell, really. Something like that. Mm. We'll just call it the dinner bell. <laughs> mm. That wraps up this episode of Joygasm. We are so glad you hung out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm where you can enjoy exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention it, it uh, well, financially, helps us continue doing this here podcast. Also, make sure you bounty hunt that subscribe button and uh, pistol whip. Or maybe even better, slowly nod really cool at that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single episode of Joygasm. And you could do a search for at Joygasm TV on your favorite social media platform of choice to join the Joygasm family in other ways. Last but not least, you could also do a search for Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. Thank you all for hanging out with us, and we will catch you all again next week.